We may live without poetry, music, and art. We may live without conscience and live without heart. We may live without friends, we may live without books, but civilized man cannot live without cooks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to Owen Meredith's uh, uh, Lucille. I love food and wine. That It's really not too surprising as I look back on my life that it ended up being a life in food and wine. Uh, the wine got started as a college freshman at Cal. That's that blue and gold place on the other side of the puddle, remember. Uh, my, in my freshman year, uh, the, I was, lived in a student co-op for two years, and uh, one of the guys in the, in the little pod that we were in brought out this bottle of Havemeyer Lidframmel, easily the least expensive German wine made, but it was in this tall, slender brown bottle. In my mind's eye, it was, it was this tall, and it was just such a pleasure drinking it. Now, there was no prohibition against alcohol in our home, my mother's brother, who lived in San Francisco, at this point we were living in Turlock in the San Joaquin Valley, he would come down to visit and he'd bring wine, whiskey, uh, brandy, beer, whatever, and they would have it with meals. And by the next time he came back, what had been left behind was still sitting on the shelf. So there was no prohibition against it, but there was also no tradition of regular drinking. So this thing to me was something really exciting and new and I just, I knew I had to learn more about this. So I went down to the closest liquor store, which in those days was one mile from campus. Cal being a land grant college, it was restricted, alcohol was restricted to being within a mile of the campus. And oh gosh, it was too expensive for me to afford. But luckily the uh, clerk said, well, you know, there's a California wine that's sort of similar. It's a similar grape. Uh, it's Grey Riesling made by Wentzi Brothers and of course it was a lot cheaper than this expensive German bottle. I bought a bottle of that and that's where I got hooked. We started going to wineries to visit on the weekends just to to see and to learn more about it. At uh, Louis Martini, the host of the tasting room was a man named Giulio Battistuzzi who had come over from uh, Italy with Louis Martini Sr., the original Louis Martini. And he just loved the fact that we were always interested. We always had a date with us. Uh, two of us went uh, with a date with with our dates, and we had taken a bottle of Italian wine because he kind of missed the old country wines and never had an opportunity to have any. And between having a a charming young freshman girl with us and having a bottle of wine that he made him smile, as soon as he shut down the tasting room, the four of us would go with him back into the bowels of the winery and sit on a stack of old crates or pa pallets or something and taste unusual things. There were a muscatel, I remember a fortified muscatel that had been returned from some shop because the little plastic capsule had shrunk and was falling off. This was 1953, 54, after the war there still was no lead for the proper lead capsule and they were experimenting with these plastics. It would not only taste it better than any sweet fortified wine I'd ever had, but we could buy it for a dollar a bottle because it was something that was not a perfect looking bottle. My mother came to visit one time and I took her to what was already then my favorite restaurant, Fisherman's Grotto Number no. 9 in San Francisco and of course I ordered that bottle of Wente Grey Riesling. Now, it fascinated me that Ma's glass was emptying out pretty quickly. And you know, I'd, I'd refill hers and mine didn't need refilling yet. And it took a while for me to wake up to what was happening. This woman was not about to let this young kid son of hers get drunk. And she was going to put it away so that he should not get drunk driving across that great big bridge all the way back to Berkeley. I just tell you, you can talk lots of stories about mother's love, but this one, it's, it's worth a laugh and it's worth a cry at the same time. It was just, just amazing. Matching food with wine uh, became the, the real challenge. And in those days, virtually every winery made wine in half bottles as well as full bottles. So I'd buy two different half bottles instead of one full bottle. And it didn't take very long to discover that I liked Cabernet more than Pinot Noir. Well, so then I'd get Cabernet from two different wineries, 
and compare them to each other and then I'd settle on my favorite Cabernet and, and on it went as I learned but tasting was was the whole story but going back to the beginning for a minute I know that it really did start with my mother and maybe some of it is genetic my parents were both Assyrians my mother was born in uh, in Assyrian we say Udumia it's up on uh, the northwest corner lake next to Lake Urumia, as it's called in Persian, except that whole region was called Rezaye when she was growing up because the Shah had named it after his father, Reza, who liked to go up there to hunt and fish um, occasionally. My father came from southeast Turkey up in the mountains, a little tiny Assyrian village called Marbishu, and they came to the United States at the time of the First World War, met and married in Chicago. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about Assyrian food history because these clay tablets that were discovered at Yale uh, had been uh, produced in 1900 BC and the French Assyriologist Jean Botero got to working with them and discovered that they had mistakenly been filed as pharmaceutical material and indeed they were actually recipes. Well believe it or not the what everybody thought the oldest cookbook was the Roman book Apicius, which was from like the year one of this uh, current uh, period. So this is two millennia before that. There were already recorded copies of food. There were 800 different food items listed. It included 20 kinds of cheese, 100 varieties of soup, 300 types of bread. Many breads were baked to be shaped or shaped into body parts, uh, grasshoppers that were fried and served on a skewer, the world's first sausages, and spices beyond number. It was just amazing. No recipe had fewer than three condiments, some as many as ten different condiments. Talking about spices, here's a cute little aside. At this year's Assyrian Aid uh, fundraising gala in San Francisco, I was standing at the uh, bar waiting for my glass of wine and the man behind me who had come recently from Iran uh, asked me about my favorite Assyrian food and I said well that had to be my mother's lamb stew, shurwa as we call it. I, I think a rough Persian equivalent would be maybe yachni or something like that, Does that would that work? Um, and I described how uh, she flavored it with basil, how she brown she would trim the fat off the meat and mince it really finely, brown it in a pan, sear the pieces of meat in the pan and then add tomatoes and onions and basil and whatever came from the garden and he said basil? No, 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 you can't have basil with a lamb shurwa. And I said well I don't know what part of the world you come from but tomatoes, onions, and basil are the square root of my mother's cooking so <laughs> that was always going to be in her shurwa and it's still my favorite one. She would can a hundred quarts of tomatoes each year. Peaches, apricots, always got a blue ribbon at the Stanislaw County Fair. We raised chickens and rabbits in the yard. We had a huge vegetable garden and would actually give fruit and vegetable to neighbors and relatives in big bagfuls and boxes. Uh, <clears throat> the summer work was always in the fields. Uh, we vaccinated chickens at one man's farm one year. Harvested melons most of the time. Grapes. And there were great lunches under the tree. That was the, the best part of being at this one Assyrian farmer's uh, place. Shamasha Yuish Galeta. Shamasha is deacon. And he was a deacon in the Assyrian Church of the East. And his wife just had to be the, the best cook ever. Cutting apricots was a little bit of a chore. We'd slice the apricots, pop out the, um, slice them in half, pop out the seed, lay it out on trays, put them into these uh, sort of racks. Then this huge box was turned over it. Sulfur stick was lit at the bottom so that it, it uh, sterilized it overnight. And then it was uncovered to start dehydrating. One summer I worked at a cannery in town operating the machine that put the syrup in the peaches before they went into the uh, uh, cooker pressure device and they had bought some of this equipment from a cannery in the Bay Area that had had a terrible fire 
And so a lot of the steel had gotten warped and twisted. So it screeched and screamed and the noise sometimes was unbearable. And some of this syrup would squirt out all over the place. I'd go home and when I took my trousers off, they would literally stand up by themselves because of being saturated with that sugar syrup. Um, after high school was coming to an end, I went to the uh, vice principal and said, is there any chance of finding a job for the summer other than working in the fields or at the cannery? And he said, well, do you like to cook? And I said, oh yeah, I love to cook. Hendy's Drive-In, little drive-in restaurant in Turlock, was looking for a cook's helper. And by golly, I got a job as a cook's helper, working both at uh, Hendy's in Turlock and the one seven miles up the road in Ceres, uh, getting close to Modesto. Um, and that, uh, two, two years before that, my father had died, and I had two younger brothers at home, so I really needed a job. And I went to High's Drive-In, H-Y apostrophe S. For those of you that know the East Bay, it was at the corner of Telegraph and MacArthur, which was determined to be the single busiest traffic intersection in America at that time. We're talking 1953. Well, Telegraph is the main north-south arterial, and MacArthur was the only way you could get onto the Bay Bridge from the East Bay. And I went into the uh, kitchen, and told the chef I would like to apply for a job as a as a cook. This guy, I'll never forget the look on his face. He couldn't figure out whether to swear at me or kick me in the pants and get me out of there. The only thing I can figure is, he figured if I was bold enough to walk in there and ask him, maybe it's worth giving it a, a chance. I looked around the kitchen and the, the cooks were these World War II vets that each had a pack of Lucky Stripes rolled up in their t-shirt sleeve. He said, you ever pop sodas down there in Turlock, Sonny? And I said, well, yeah, on my day off, I'd come in and, and help in the fountain. That was, frankly, a total lie, but I had to have a job. He took me to the front of the house and introduced me to the front end manager, whose job was to uh, coordinate the food coming out of the kitchen the hot food and the cold stuff from the fountain and assembling it on a tray for the car hops to take out to the cars. They were all on skates, so it was a really fast-moving operation. And um, fortunately, he hired me, and the most important lesson I learned was to never ask the same question twice because everybody does things a little bit differently. When I got the first order I had for a, uh, uh, a chocolate... Um, a Sunday, uh, not a Sunday, a uh, float, I turned to the uh, manager and said, how do you guys uh, do your, uh, do you start with whipped cream or do you put the chocolate in or would you rather use ice cream for it? He said, here, let me just show you. And he did it once. Well, from then on, that's exactly how I did it. And that question was never asked again. So I had to pretend that I knew what I was talking about. Um, it, it turned out to be a lot of fun. And, and I got more and more involved in the restaurant business. Actually, I never dreamt that I would really be in the restaurant business uh, once I finished school. Uh, the restaurant business, nights and weekends are your busiest time. When people are playing the hardest, you're working the hardest. I knew I would get married, I'd have kids, um, but the bottom line is that I really love people. I love food and I love wine. And with the restaurant, f food and wine and people sort of blended together very smoothly and very easily. Uh, in 1959, I got a job at the Potluck Restaurant in Berkeley. It was the first restaurant in the East Bay to, to have a sort of a French or European kind of feel to it. Uh, the uh, meal started with soup served in a large tureen that the customers helped themselves with, a salad was a mixed greens and a large wooden bowl. They again helped themselves and there was a lazy Susan with three different dressings. A French dressing, a blue cheese dressing, and a, a kidney bean and garbanzo marinated. Uh, and then the entree was served with uh, rice pilaf and a vegetable. In those days they were frozen vegetables by the way. And dessert was just an apple and a piece of cheese. And um, I uh, took the job as manager uh, 
because I just, as I say, had, had stopped running away from it. I, I worked as the relief bartender one summer and then I took the, the manager's job. I became a junior partner and the the good and sad part of this story all at the same time is that after 11 years my senior partner decided that he wanted to run it alone and suddenly I was out of a job. Uh, well, I knew I would have to start my own restaurant because I just loved it so much. I also knew that I could not have a partner and I could not have a landlord because I had just seen too many stories where the landlord gets along perfectly well with, with a productive manager or chef after a few years and they're out and he's in. Uh, or he raises the rent so high that uh, that becomes a problem. And so I searched around. Um, first of all, I started doing catering immediately. I just had to do something to pay the bills and I could do that without having a real restaurant yet. There was a restaurant, uh, rather a bar on University Avenue in Berkeley that had a full kitchen in the back but had not been used for years. So I made an arrangement to use that kitchen to prepare my food in and whenever, whatever day I was there I would also make some trays of hors d'oeuvres and bring them out to the bar for them. So you know, it was a, a friendly relationship both ways. Um, I had $15,000 which was basically my payout from the potluck. I got a $10,000 loan from my attorney an $8,000 loan from my doctor. Friends gave me as much as $2,000 as advance payment against meals they would have in the restaurant. <laughs> and uh, I found a building that was for sale uh, just about two miles north of Berkeley in a little town of Kensington, but people really think of it as part of Berkeley. But you drive, not two miles, it's a little over a mile, you drive that mile through a quiet residential area and suddenly hear a couple blocks of shops. Well, there was a grocery store that had gone out of business and it was owned by a man in Berkeley who had bought it as, as an investment. Well, that one didn't work out too well. For six months, he had no rent coming in. He also had bought some rental housing units in Berkeley and rent strikes were just starting in Berkeley. So he wanted to get out of ownership of real estate in a bad way. <laughs> He accepted a really uh, good offer, favorable to me. He carried back a second mortgage. I got the loan, and we set to work to make that into a restaurant. Um, the, uh, there was a little tiny church across the Calusa Circle from us that protested uh, the restaurant having a liquor license. And um, I, in fact, these people were going around the neighborhood with a petition claiming that I was going to have a loud rock and roll place with uh, topless waitresses. I mean, it was just a <laughs> hilarious kind of thing. I talked to the Kensington police chief. He checked the record with the alcohol beverage control, found that never in all the years I was at the potluck had there been a single complaint filed, that we had never had any problems, that that was nothing related to what we did, and we got the permit and got started. Designing the restaurant in itself proved to be a lot of fun. We found a 200,000 gallon redwood tank up in the Oakland Hills. It was called the Beacon Hill Reservoir, part of the East Bay Water Service. And it had been decommissioned to be replaced by a 2 million gallon underground concrete vault. The toughest thing was getting a permit to dismantle this thing and take it down and getting the insurance for that permit, I say, was, was the really tough part. But we did finally get that. And this thing was 45 feet in diameter and 18 feet high. Uh, for a few of you who remember those days and had been at that restaurant, we reconstructed a section of that curved wall with the rough hewn material on the outside. <coughs> we sandblasted it to get rid of the splinters. And the rest of the wood we ran through a mill and resurfaced. Now this is virgin forest redwood three by eights of the most intense concentrated texture and color. It was just a magnificent material and we use that throughout the, the restaurant. Um, in 1974-75 that recession hit. We hadn't been open very long and getting a new restaurant started in an out-of-the-way place meant you really had to be paying attention. We started a, a petite dinner from 5 o'clock to 6.30. Uh, 
uh, our normal dinners were five courses. For the petite dinner, we took $3 off the menu and you could have any three courses that you wanted. Now this is going to sound like a sexist statement, but I can tell you the men invariably had the appetizer, the entree, and dessert. And the women very often had the soup and the salad and an appetizer or the soup and the salad and dessert. But under no condition did the women have the main course. So when you wonder how did the arithmetic come out, it, it balanced out in the long run. We also started the Monday night dinners. We did a dinner from a different foreign country each Monday in addition to the regular menu. And for that Monday night dinner, we chose a white wine and a red wine to uh, go with the appetizer in the main course. And both were offered by the bottle or the glass at a reduced price. And the glass price, we poured five glasses to the bottle and the glass price was one fifth of the bottle price. In other words, you weren't getting penalized for getting the glass. And it, it turned out with people coming in, Mondays became frequently the second busiest day of the week after Saturday. It frequently would outdo Friday. Uh, and people would just sit down and say, just bring us the special with a glass of each. It, it really made a difference in, in getting things underway. Uh, we did a spring festival in April and a harvest festival in the fall. And for that, we would have as many as 20 different wines available by the bottle or the glass. In January, we did a Beaujolais Nouveau festival. Beaujolais Nouveau, <coughs> what was just made in France a month or two before it had barely finished fermenting. In some cases, we'd buy a small barrel of it and it was still sort of spritzy mm -hmm. as we tapped it out to serve. Uh, but it, all of these contributed to, to developing what we were all about and wine was a pretty important part of what we were. The basic wine list had 400 wines on it with an additional 1,200 rarities on a special bound volume. The seller had 60,000 bottles, that's 5,000 cases of wine that, uh, that supported this thing. The New York Times called it one of the 10 best wine lists in the world. I want to back up a bit and talk about the, the Berkeley food scene. Uh, the, in 1954, the potluck started at the foot of University Avenue. And it was called potluck by its original owner because you quite literally took potluck. He only made one dinner each night, sort of like a little tiny neighborhood bistro. And uh, there was a family style soup and salad and the apple and cheese for dessert. In 1958, it moved to another location at San Pablo and Channing. He brought in a partner that had some money. They bought a liquor license, put in a full bar, a complete kitchen, and a full menu. Actually, in 58, they moved there, and in 59 is when I started as manager and ran that until 1970. Berkeley was, was in, in a turmoil that was more than just the, uh, that great movement of student revolt that we all know about. In food, in the early 60s, the co-op grocery opened a store at Shattuck <coughs> and uh, Cedar. And it was listed as having the highest per capita sales of any grocery store in America. Well, this was at the north end of the downtown area. So it supplied groceries for all of the people up in the Berkeley Hills, up into Kensington, the east side hills, and the north as well. And so it really, really had the finest quality of everything. They, <clears throat> 1966, Pete's opened a coffee shop at Walnut and Vine. And I really give Alfred Pete credit for teaching America how to appreciate really high quality coffee and dark roasted coffee. Nobody else was doing anything like that. A little aside here, uh, for the first year that Starbucks was in business, Alfred Pete provided their coffee. And they ended up buying him out when he, when he chose to retire. In 1967, the cheese board opened just around the corner from uh, Pete's. In 1971, Chez Panisse, the restaurant opened. In 1972, some five months later, I opened Narcy's. In 1973, Pig by the Tail opened a charcuterie. That was the first charcuterie to open in the Bay Area in over 30 years. Cocolot opened in 1976. My favorite story of all about Cocolot is a little bit self-serving, but I, I hope you'll indulge me. Um, one of the absolute rules 
in the restaurant business has to be if you're going to be the maitre d you simply never step into a conversation or interfere with people talking but as i walked past the table and heard a woman say oh and you should try the chocolate decadence because they get it from coke a lot and i stopped in my tracks and turned around and said excuse me i'm sorry but i just happened to hear that we had created chocolate decadence at narcy's and um a young lady sitting here has a mother who was our catering uh, coordinator, catering designer. And she is the one credited with inventing the name Chocolate Decadence. We had a, uh, a, a doctor named uh, Barney Rhodes who was quite a port expert and he had scheduled a banquet in the back banquet room and was going to do a lot with port. Well, I figured the only dessert you can have with port is rich chocolate. So I went to the pastry chef and said, here it is. It's got to be the richest, darkest, deepest, densest chocolate thing we can possibly put together. So that week at the manager's meeting, we brought one out for the managers to taste. And Rachel Harris, bless her soul, says, oh, this is decadence. This is chocolate decadence. And everybody at the table in unison said, that's it, that's it, that's the name of it, chocolate decadence. <laughs> and from that moment on, it was named as chocolate decadence. Even when other people, you know, we published all these recipes. There was no, to this day, I don't believe in secret recipes. That's just nonsense. You could uh, look around and you'll find something similar to or comparable that somebody did somewhere. Well, I've often felt that California's success in the wine industry uh, really was a very, very important part towards the evolution of California cuisine. Because we already had some of the world's greatest wine being made. We were right in the middle between Livermore and Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, or Sanapa Noma, as we used to jokingly call it. Uh, there were all these amazing wineries. And uh, back in the potluck, we had a tasting of 1962 Morachet. Morachet is the greatest white burgundy made in France. I, I should probably say made in the world. Who could make a better uh, wine than that? And a um, man named James Zellerbach, who had been the ambassador to Italy, so fell in love um, with burgundy that he came home deciding that he was going to make burgundy-style wine in California. He opened a winery called Hansel, named after his wife, Hannah Zellerbach, Hansel. And he hired a team of geologists to find the piece of soil, which happened to be in Sonoma County, that most matched what it was in Burgundy. And by golly, we had a bottle of Chardonnay that he had made that was bottled under the Heights label. Heights was a very important producer in the Napa Valley. And when uh, Hansel uh, Zellerbach died, he bought the entire inventory of bulk wine and finished bottling it himself. So we had the five great vineyards from Morachet and this one California Chardonnay. We tasted them together and not a single one of the judges could say which wine was the California wine. Well, aside from choosing the vineyard and choosing the great clones and choosing um, how they were handled, the perhaps most important thing that Zellerbach did was he imported the oak barrels from France. Nobody had given any serious attention to oak. I mean, what's oak? It's this hard, solid thing that's, uh, that has nothing to do with anything. That's just what you're storing the wine. Well, not true. The forest at Limoges has an oak that tastes very different from the forest at Nevers. Well, it's only tradition that the forest at Limoges provides burgundy and the forest at Nevers provides Bordeaux. That's the tradition is because of proximity. Well, by golly, he brought those barrels over and Heights used the same barrels. And so suddenly California was really on a track. Um, that great tasting that happened in, uh, in Paris in 1976, which became known as the Judgment of Paris. <laughs> Time Magazine did this huge cover story on it. There were uh, California Cabernets against French uh, Red Bordeaux and California Chardonnay against French White Burgundies. And the French still can't believe what happened. The 1973 Stag's Leap Cabernet from the Napa Valley, which was the first vintage 
that a college professor from Michigan had made at his new winery and 1973 Chateau Marlene of Chardonnay both beat the French mm -hmm. and California was on a roll or on a roar. French food writers about this time discovered something they called Nouvelle Cuisine. Um, I remember a, uh, a story in New York Magazine, a cover story on Michel Gerard who uh, had taken Cuisine uh, Nouvelle one step further, he made Cuisine Mansur, which was kind of a diet version of Cuisine Nouvelle at his spa. And I read this story about this new invention, and he talked about braising the meat and using all kinds of greens from the garden, including even pine needles from a tree to flavor. And I thought, you know, my mother grew up in a building made out of mud in northwest Iran. And the way she made her stew, as I mentioned earlier, she cut the fat off the meat, rendered it out in the pan, browned the meat in that same fat, added vegetables and herbs. We never knew until she came back from out in the garden what the vegetables were going to be on that particular day in the stew. But I said, this guy claims he's invented a new style of cooking, and this has been going on probably for centuries in that little village. French food style started changing, literally changing annually, just like fashion fads. Um, it was sh sherry vinegar one year, raspberry vinegar another year. Thai Avant restaurant was not only my favorite restaurant in the world in Paris, but I actually patterned the design of my menu on the Thai Avant menu. I remember ordering foie gras and it came having been uh, sauteed in a pan and duck fat and then deglazed with raspberry vinegar. I mean, that was in vogue that year. Green peppercorns, pink peppercorns, warm salads. I mean, there were these strange combinations and everybody was using them. Caroline Bates of Gourmet Magazine said, Chez Panisse and Narcisse were serving California cuisine. I called Alice Waters and said, hey, what's California cuisine? She said, I was hoping you'd tell me. <laughs> the, the truth is, we were doing what we what we sort of felt like doing. We had fun with what we were doing. We enjoyed it. Uh, both of us had our our roots were really in French style of cooking, but the ingredients we used were certainly different from the French ingredients. I swear, I don't think today you'd find very many traditionally trained French chefs that would use fresh ginger the way we use it on the West Coast. Or well, with our exposure to the Pacific, to Japan and uh, Hawaii and uh, <coughs> China, the young ginger is used practically as a vegetable. We slice it thinly and saute it with vegetables for a few seconds. But at classically trained French chef, ginger is a dry powder that you put into spice cake and it rarely gets beyond that. Well, hell, we'd go to the Napa Valley and harvest wild mustard blossoms in the springtime to put in our salads. Or we'd go out to the ocean and harvest mussels. Mussels were not available in the stores in those days and use mussels as an appetizer. Chez Panisse, my goodness, Alice had half the people living in the Berkeley Hills growing baby lettuces for a mescaline salad. So what we were doing was, was swinging with the times and with our location and what was available to us. Uh, it's fascinating to realize that that this repetition in styles from year to year was nothing new. Over 200 years ago, Alexander Dumas wrote about there being 40 different varieties of mustard in Paris. Uh, and 40 different varieties being made in general. There were 84 varieties in Paris by 1812. And we had just started packaging some uh, preserves under our own label and I was going to Paris and I thought gee it'd be nice if we could get some Dijon mustard with our label on it. So the French government uh, uh, office in charge of, of food production gave me the list of places to visit and provided a young woman as an interpreter. We found this place that was already making mustard for Fauchons easily my favorite food store in the world and I'm thinking wow this guy who makes mustard for Fauchons is going to make Narcisse Dijon mustard for me 
So we're tasting all these mustards and I'm getting all excited about it. And almost in passing I said, by the way, what kind of mustard seed do you use? He said, American. <laughs> Wait a minute, he obviously misunderstood me. So I turned to the young woman who was translating and repeated the question carefully and she repeated to him and he said, oh, we, oui, oui, Mr. American, sometimes Canadian. And I said, but, 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 but the label says Dijon, ah, oh, mais oui, monsieur, that is the style of the mustard. So I came home thinking, we're shipping American mustard to France. They're putting it into a mill with French water and French vinegar and sometimes French wine and putting it in a bottle and shipping it back to us as Dijon mustard. Well, it didn't take very long to discover that Morehouse mustard, located in those days in Emeryville, was more than happy to make me mustard <laughs> using the mustard seed with uh, white wine and white wine vinegar and salt and no other ingredients in it. And I have to confess that I was not about to call it Dijon mustard. I called it Dijon style mustard. But part of my question of what kind of mustard to use was based on the fact that American mustard is always this bright poster paint yellow color. I mean, it looks so different from uh, Dijon mustard. I know about the white mustard seed and the uh, brown mustard seed and about the Asian or oriental mustard seed as it was called which has a more pungent oil, a little more pronounced kick to it. Well lo and behold the reason ours has poster paint color is that we add turmeric to it. And now the next time you pick up a bottle of that stuff be sure to read the label because the US has ruled that turmeric is such a powerful colorant that it cannot be lumped in with spices. Usually spices are all just lumped in under the word spices. The word turmeric must appear on the label. It's poster paint yellow from turmeric. Thank you very much. Well, here's a, a charming quote from a cookbook. The dishes of the present day are very light. The new cookery is conducive to health, to good temper, and to long life. And now can I tell you that that was written by Louis Mercier's f for his cookbook in 1782. So these cycles have come and gone and they'll continue coming and going as long as people are people. Catering. Some of the catering things we did were, were, were pretty crazy. Uh, all of the Day on the Green concerts that Bill Graham had, we provided the backstage food. I met Bill when he had first come out from New York to help Ronnie Davis at the San Francisco Meme Troupe, helping him promote the Meme Troupe. And uh, Ronnie came up with the idea of having a rock concert, and they did it at the old Fillmore Auditorium. Bill called and asked if I could get him some bushels of apples. He wanted red apples and green apples, and they <clears throat> had to be in old-fashioned bushel baskets. Ordering the apples was easy. Finding the bushel baskets wasn't so easy because already cardboard boxes were in use, but I found those for him. And he stressed he wanted to show a picture of, of sort of good and proper healthful things because everybody was into dope of one sort or another and, and doing different kinds of drugs and he wanted to set a better tone. Uh, for the Thanksgiving dinner done at the last performance of the band. It was called The Last Waltz, performed by the band. He had 3,000 people that came for Thanksgiving dinner and he would not let me uh, use boneless turkey rolls. He wanted all the turkeys roasted on the bone. Well, first of all, where in the world am I going to roast enough turkey for 3,000 people if I have to do whole turkeys? We rented a 24-foot uh, truck and uh, drove down Mission Street in San Francisco. All of the restaurant equipment supply houses were on Mission Street. And I went down the line from one to another buying gas ranges, used gas ranges, whatever brand they had, because they have a universal hookup line for the gas. And in the basement of Winterland, we uh, set up this kitchen. We Luckily, the windows were, there was about, 30 inches of window because it was, you know, the cellar was underground, but there was enough headspace. We took out some of the windows and put in exhaust blowers, and we roasted all those turkeys there and put the entire meal together. At just about the time they were going to break 
for the meal. We had set up the buffet tables in the hallways. I turned to Bill and said, you know, it's this funny feeling in the pit of your stomach when you think, what if somebody screwed up? What if somebody made a mistake? What if somebody did something wrong and a bunch of people get sick? Narcy, you're only as good as your last show. <laughs> that was his word of advice. To my knowledge, nobody got sick. Everybody was happy and it all worked out very well. We had New Year's breakfast one year for 6,000 people for Bill. It was at the Carousel Ballroom and at Winterland, uh, both. Uh, they had, he had music going all night long and then served breakfast at 6 o'clock in the morning. And he would not let me buy pre-shelled uh, eggs that bakeries use all the time. You know, it comes, it's been scrambled, it's perfectly safe, there's nothing weird in it. But he want, we cracked fresh eggs <laughs> to make scrambled eggs for 6,000 people. And there was uh, fruit and sweet rolls and coffee and tea and so forth. Um, Ernest Gallo of winemaking fame asked if I would cater his 50th wedding anniversary. And that man, until the day he died, lived in a house that he had bought when he was first married back in the 30s um, on Mays Road uh, outside of the town of Modesto. His son, David, built an amazing estate on the other side of Modesto, east of Modesto. Modesto, as you can imagine, is the very heart of the valley. It's perfectly flat. His son brought in hundreds of tons of dirt to create mounds and texture to his property. Ernest had exactly what he started with. The problem was, how am I going to serve a hot pasta appetizer to 500 people and it was outdoors uh, on his lawn. We set up five separate stations so each station only had to cook for 100 people. He flew in his favorite pasta from New York and I can tell you that it was a very very successful event. I like to think that in all the years one of the very very few compliments that Ernest Gallo ever gave anybody who worked for him was 10 years later when for his 60th anniversary he called and asked if I would cater that and I said I'd, I was no longer in business, I had closed the business, I didn't have a staff, I didn't have the equipment and he never forgave me for that so that's mm -hmm. my interpretation of his way of complimenting me for what I did <laughs> on his 50th. There was no way he was going to tell me it was a great job. He was a fascinating man. I did write a cookbook called Monday Night at Narcy's. It's a collection of some 50 menus from that Monday Night Dinner series. And right now I'm editing a book that'll be titled Every Night at Narcy's because it's the everyday cooking, the kind of stuff you, you know, throw together when you go into the kitchen. In about 1983, uh, this young Assyrian man walked into my office and wanted to make a monument of the ancient Assyrian King Ashurbanipal. His name was Fred Parhad. And I thought, well, th this is interesting. How'd you happen to come up here? How'd you find me? And he said, well, I'm working at the studio of a friend just up the street, and I came into your market. We had built a market next door to the restaurant, and I noticed there were some Assyrian sausages. <clears throat> and I said, what's with the Assyrian sausages? How do you happen? And they said, well, the owner is an Assyrian. Oh, he says, could I talk to him? So he came up to the office to talk to me. Well, by golly, I looked at a sketch that he had, not a sketch, a photograph that he had, and then subsequently he brought the maquette that he made for the Ashurbanipal, and boy, I was I was blown away. I mean, wow, he wants to do a monument-sized piece of this thing and donate it to the city. We started the Assyrian Foundation for the Arts, <clears throat> and in 1988 we installed the Ashurbanipal at the side entrance of the main San Francisco Library. And if you were to go by today, you'd see he stands there on a pedestal that's about five feet high, and the statue itself is either nine or ten feet. So it's quite a, a substantial thing. And in the intervening years, the library bought the property across the street and built a whole new library from the ground up. The old library became the Asian Art Museum. So he stands there with his back to the Asian Art Museum <clears throat> looking across at the main library. In his right arm he's clasping a lion cub, 
somewhat a symbol of his power. In his left hand, he's holding a clay tablet, and it has an inscription both in cuneiform, uh, well, in the tablet, it's just in cuneiform, but on the base, it's translated into English as well. Peace unto heaven and earth, peace unto countries and cities, peace unto the dwellers in all lands. This is the statue presented to the city of San Francisco by the Assyrian people in the 210th year of America's sovereignty. Now, this is not a reproduction of a 2,500 year old statue. This is a contemporary Assyrian artist giving you his rendition of what might be interpreted as a picture of Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal had the world's first library, which is what the appeal was for having it at the library and having that cuneiform in the tablet. An Assyrian woman in Turlock is an Assyriologist who wrote out the script. And I have to confess that Fred allowed me to inscribe or imprint the cuneiform on the clay tablet itself before he fired it and from that made the mold to uh, to make the casting. And the way that dates were set in those days were in the year of the regime of such and such a person. Uh, we chose the sovereignty of the United States rather than getting into any politics over who did or didn't happen to be the president at that time. <clears throat> I'm really very proud of my Assyrian heritage. Uh, in 1974, I went and found my mother's village uh, in, uh, in Urmia. I visited Tehran, Isfahan, and Qom with some dear friends of, of Abbas Milani's who just squired me around the country so beautifully. At Qom, they practically jumped on me when I pulled out my camera and started taking pictures of people that don't let anybody see with that camera with the, you know that's that's the holiest of, of holies in Iran and uh, and that would have been trouble. Um, I also met this man named uh, Parviz Kalantari, uh, a remarkable artist. He had taken uh, this one piece that I brought home. I have a couple of pieces. It's maybe five feet wide and 18 or 20 inches high, a piece of white canvas, and he took some of the clay and straw mixture that's used to build the homes and smeared it coarsely on this canvas and then painted with transparent brown. It's a village uh, scene. It's just an amazing piece that we are so, so fond of. So I got to, um, uh, to Urmi and, and saw my mother's birthplace. Her home was gone, but I did meet people that knew the Sayed family that uh, she came from. Uh, Shulamith Sayed uh, was her name. My father was Michael Mikhail Chinu David, and I think I mentioned earlier he was from Marbishu, a little town in the Turkish uh, southeast. Um, so although my mother's home was gone, I saw the location and I saw other homes that were still standing. The walls and the floors were dirt. Now, mind you, this is not a, a euphemism for adobe block. They did not bake uh, adobe block in the sun or in a kiln or anything else. They just took that soil, and you could see the shovel marks, or they put a shovel full in, and as they lifted the shovel off, it left its streak. And they built a wall. There was no timber. Timber was saplings that were three inches in diameter, and those were used to lay across the walls to create a roof. And after a heavy rain, you had to get up on the roof the next morning and trowel in some more mud to make for the rivulets that were created by the storm. Um, the tanuira, as we call it, I'm not sure what that would be called in, in uh, Persian, but it's like a tandoor oven, except instead of a freestanding device, this was in the ground. If you can visualize a hole in the ground about 24 to 30 inches deep, that was shaped sort of like a vase, small at the top and enlarged. The fuel was cow dung. Remember, there wasn't enough wood to be able to burn it. The cow dung was dried and saved and used as fuel throughout the year. And so the fire was burned until that thing got hot enough to be like a tandoor oven. And my mother's description, I'll never forget how on baking day, which was generally once a week, uh, the women would wrap their arms with 
old rags and clothes to just protect them from the heat. They roll out the flat bread and reach down and slap it against the wall of that tanura. And within two or three minutes, it's blistering up and starting to turn brown and they have to pull it out. Well, they only baked once a week. This bread would dry out so quickly that it was like a cracker, which is, you know, the ingredients are water, yeast, flour, and salt. Uh, there's nothing there that's going to spoil. And uh, each night before going to bed, they would take as many loaves as they thought they needed for the next day, sprinkle them with water, wrap them in towels, so that overnight it would slowly moisturize. And by the morning it was soft enough that you could roll up a sandwich in it, you could tear off a piece and use it as a scoop. It was, it was the bread. I, I tell you, it was, it was an overwhelming experience for me to think that my mother grew up in this mud building. Uh, she came to the United States, did get a high school education, got married, produced three children, all of whom have been successful in their own way, in their own world, um, and came from what, what you could easily call nothing. But what she did have that's not nothing was a sense of family, a sense of belonging, a sense of commitment, uh, the sense of what humanity is really all about. And the, the power of the human spirit is just so, so critically important uh, for me. And, and I can't get the need for education out of my mind. Um, the need to give back to the community. And I'm often asked, what do I do with my time now that I no longer have the restaurant? Well, I uh, have gotten involved in more nonprofits than I really needed to do, but I, once, you, once you get hooked, you, you can't say no. Uh, two weeks ago, I was helping the San Francisco, San Francisco Suicide Prevention for their annual event to raise money. We had two dinners at our home, uh, one at the end of March and one just last Saturday. Uh, that were auctioned off as fundraisers for the Berkeley Rep. I was on the founding board and former chairman of the board of the Berkeley Rep. Uh, I was on the founding board of the Berkeley Community Fund uh, and I was president for 15 years before I talked somebody else <laughs> to take it over for me. Um, I wasn't the founding president of the Assyrian Aid Society but I was, became president after the first two years and was president for 18 years. And the Assyrian Aid Society, quite unusual among nonprofit organizations, it was founded in 1993 and it has raised over 15 million dollars and the current figures show that 93 percent of the money that was raised has gone directly to help the Assyrians, mainly in Iraq. There have been a couple of instances um, in Iran and in Georgia um, in the Soviet Union but but it was primarily Iraq where Saddam Hussein was raising hell and in the north of the country uh, there was enough safe haven in the Kurdish lands. Well now even that's turning against them since ISIS came along and the whole thing is in turmoil. But we built schools we translated the entire curriculum from Arabic into Assyrian and printed books. Um, we, uh, we bought buses to transport the kids from their little villages into the city where we built dormitories. So they would be there uh, through the week and on the weekend the bus would take them back into their village and, and bring them back. Uh, the Berkeley Repertory Theater, I was on the founding board. Uh, Pacific Coast Farmers Market I uh, was on the founding board and ran it for 10 years and it is the largest farmers market organization in the country at 51 separate market days a week and there are numerous other smaller organizations that uh, that I just am so impressed with and, and endeared of that that I, I can't say no to them so uh, nonprofit has, has proved to be just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. So I understand we have some time for questions. Uh, if anybody has a question, I'd certainly be happy to try and answer them. Yes, sir. Um, past, uh, from, uh, first of all, 
Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, taking the time and displaying the culture of uh, Sudan, uh, rich culture, and to learn uh, uh, to the uh, American know that uh, there was uh, before the Greek and, and Roman Persian and the Sudan and the Roman and so forth. Now, besides the uh, tomato, basil, and onions, what is your favorite ingredient? <laughs> what is the go-to food you go to get up in the morning and say, I want to have this today? What do you cook for yourself? Well, I mean, the last the, one is, oh. do you have a per favorite Persian food? A, a favorite what? Persian food. A favorite Persian, Persian food. food. Oh, boy, my favorite Persian food. Uh, well, this isn't the main course, but the Mastachyar is so much, so much like <laughs> what the Syrians do. It's yogurt with cucumber. Um, I'm going to have to think about the Persian food one. But the go-to um, has really been the herb basil. My mother didn't use much saffron or the more exotic stuff like that. She grew virtually all of her own herbs in the garden. And that, that Assyrian lamb stew with the basil uh, would be at the top of my list. But the dolma she made, uh, the basic dolma was grape leaves with lamb, uh, and rice and herbs, but she used to make something uh, uh, that she simply called mixed dolma. In the middle of summer, she would take small tomatoes and hollow them out, and um, cabbage leaves and roll. And any time she used cabbage, she used pork for the meat rather than beef or uh, lamb, which sounds unusual to some people. But the Assyrians do eat pork, um, and so she would have cabbage roll-ups, little tomatoes, zucchini squash, the, uh, you know, the small ones would be hollowed out and, and stuffed, uh, eggplants, small uh, yellow wax peppers, and uh, tomato-based sauce for the pan. And all of these flavors blend together. It is just absolutely wonderful. And her rice, uh, as a child, I could have easily told you that her rice pilaf was my favorite of all. Always. Everybody else, when we had the rice and the shorwa at the same time, would put the shorwa on top of the rice. I wanted the rice by itself. I wanted to appreciate it for the simplicity and the beauty that it was, and I ate the meat separately. But lots of memories. Thank you very much. You. Yes, question here. Yeah, uh, what would you be your uh, advice for someone who wants to open a restaurant and want to go to? Advice for somebody wanting to open a restaurant, uh, the, if you want the one word answer, it's don't. Uh, <laughs> um, I have to tell you that the restaurant scene has changed and continues to change so dramatically that I'm, I'm frankly a little confused. We know that young people want things faster, they're always in a hurry. Uh, we know that the art of of people communicating with each other seems to be going out the window. When you go into a restaurant and see six young people at a table, each one looking at their cell phone instead of talking to each other, I, you kind of scratch your head. These fast casual restaurants, which are the real in vogue thing these days, are not bashful about what they're charging. Um, a, a new place, just a pasta place opened on College Avenue not far from our home that gets twelve and thirteen dollars for a plate of pasta you have to stand in line choose the menu from the wall pay oh and that that's another thing that drives me nuts you they ask for your credit card and they spin this ipad around for you to sign and it says gratuity fifteen percent twenty percent and i'm thinking wait a minute gratuity is supposed to be kind of a thank you for good service and they want my gratuity before they've even done their job and all, all they do when they do their job is bring it, the dish and put it on your table and walk away. You want water, you have to get up and walk to the water fountain to get yourself a glass of water. Well, just a block and a half away, there's an Italian restaurant that also gets 12 or $13 for their pasta dishes, but it's with full service. So I'm left kind of confused. I think if you can come up with a new idea or be in a neighborhood, like look at this amazing craziness that's gotten... Uh, publicized recently with these uh, uh, Japanese pancakes that are an inch thick, light and fluffy. 
Well, somebody came up with something truly new. It's the same ingredients you have in pancake batter, except a much higher ratio of egg whites, so that it's light and fluffy, and it's a, a little more effort to do it. But if you come up with something that's either totally new, or you come up with a neighborhood that really needs something. But be really careful that you study the importance of food cost, and be conscious when you start how much money you expect to make. When I was in the restaurant business, we were very happy with a 7 or 8% profit. I talk to young restaurateurs these days, and they want to talk 15 to 20% profit. Well, labor is expensive in restaurants. There's no getting around it. And I hear more people than ever saying, oh, no, the labor will kill you. How can you possibly do that? At Narcy's, we not only had plenty of labor, but we I joined the union. In fact, I had to call the union three times to get them to come out. I guess at first they thought, this guy's opening a restaurant up in Kensington in the hills. That's not going to be much of a place for us. You know, they, they just didn't bother until... I got angry one day and talked to the uh, the office manager and said, look, I, I've been a member of the union all the time I've worked in the business and I want my restaurant to have a, a union scale and uh, and have medical benefits. Well, by union scale, by the way, the only employees I had that got paid union scale were the waiters and the busboys. Everybody else was paid over scale because the waiters and busboys made so much money in tips. And let me tell you, in those days, a lot of those sales were on cash, not people didn't use credit cards that much, which meant those those guys were putting all that money in their pocket and didn't even have to pay tax on it. Um, but we provided full coverage uh, for our employees. Um, everybody else got more than union scale. The dishwashers, gosh, if a, if a guy gets upset and walks out in the middle of the shift, and the chef doesn't have clean dishes to put the food on, you got to stop serving food, right? <laughs> it's no, every, every single portion of the business needs to come together. And there are several organizations that are providing some um, uh, group dynamics to work with. In fact, there's a woman that used to do some catering work for me that started a business in Oakland uh, and does classes online. I'll, I'll give you her information um, for learning a little bit about the restaurant business in greater detail before you get into it. Yes, sir. Um, first, I just want to thank you for all the work you do with the AIDS Society. I had the pleasure of visiting those schools in the northern of Iraq in 2014, and my sister just came back from her trip this week. Um, they're the single most hopeful thing that I've seen in that country, so thank you. Um, my question for you is, um, as a young Assyrian American born here um, at a time when the community in California wasn't very established, what inspired you to stay connected to your heritage and give back? Well, my heritage, uh, the commitment to heritage is, is purely my parents. Uh, my father and mother were really dedicated to preserving our Assyrianism. My dad said um, there was no way he could teach us English as well as we'd learn it in school and on the outside. So at home we had to speak Assyrian. And I not only learned how to speak Assyrian, I was able to write it and read it. And I was involved in the church. I became an altar boy in the Church of the East, then a subdeacon, and finally a deacon, actually. Um, so the, the, the part of being an Assyrian was always important to me. Um, my wife is not an Assyrian, so our son did not learn Assyrian, so things do get filtered out. But her background is, is not terribly different. Her parents are from Bulgaria. So um, just knowing and, and seeing what the Assyrians were up against motivated me, perhaps more than anything else, to want to help and want to be involved. Yes. Um, I, I'm also a fellow Cal alumni, so go Bears. And, uh -huh. uh, I was just curious, what were you studying while you were at Cal, and were you expecting to go into the profession that you went into right after school? Uh, actually, I started out as a pre-dent student, um, because my father had pushed for that, uh, thinking that dentists make as much money as doctors do, but they get to work a regular shift and go home every night and weekends. And I thought, well, that's that's pretty neat. So I registered. There was no such thing as a pre-dent major, but I was taking 
math and science classes that that would satisfy those requirements. And then one day I went to a a session put on by the dental school, and they gave us a little block of plaster and told us to sand it and carve it down to make it exactly a one inch cube. And as I sat there rubbing this thing and measuring it and rubbing it, I'm thinking, somehow the thought of standing there with my hand in somebody's mouth, where they can't talk, and I talk a lot, as you may have noticed, uh, and carving things in there, I, that, that just can't, and I started having some very emotive thoughts about doctors saving people's lives and so forth, and I was going to, well, there was no pre-med major in those days either, so I declared a math major just because I loved math. Um, the the first year, that was my soft, my junior year, um, it was easy, easily the toughest class I ever took and the most exciting class I ever took was math six, which was a combination of math 3A and 3B at the same time. So it was six units, and it met at 8 o'clock in the morning, six days a week. <laughs> it was a real killer. But what happened was um, I just got so involved in the uh, in work and making, making a living. I was sending money home to help my mother because I had two younger brothers there. And I only stayed at the student co-op for two years because once uh, my older, the, the middle brother, I was the oldest. When the middle brother came up to live with me, I couldn't live in the co-op anymore, so we got an apartment. And then two years later, the younger brother came up. Um, and so it just, I evolved away from it. The, re, the obligations were such that I just moved away from it. I never even got my degree. So I can say, roll on you bears, but I <laughs> I didn't, didn't get the little diploma. Yes? Hi, Nursei. So, fun fact, my dad is also from Marvishu, so like... Oh, well, hello there. I'd be related. Um, <laughs> but so you talk about food constantly changing, but one thing that I realized is that Assyrian food has not changed for centuries. And you just mentioned some foods that my mom makes today. And so what do you think is the reason as to why Assyrian food has not really changed? In well, I think I may disagree with you a little bit um, because I have at least six Assyrian cookbooks at home. Um, and um, the more recent they are, the less Assyrian they are. And the reason, I think, is pretty clear. Uh, when my mother's generation came, they came directly from the villages. So the food that they cooked didn't have cookbooks and recipes written out for them. They dealt with the provender that came from the garden and from uh, their own field. Um, and the tradition evolved. Um, I saw a cookbook recently published by an Assyrian woman in Australia. Very, very good cookbook. I like a lot of the recipes in it, but it really looks more like Persian food than Assyrian food. As a matter of fact, she unhesitatingly uses the Persian names for some of the dishes, and I'm thinking, I wonder why she even calls it Assyrian. So the, the Assyrians that stayed behind um, you couldn't possibly be living in Tehran without being exposed to more Persian things in the grocery stores, in the markets, in the uh, food halls, in people's homes, and all of that influences uh, what you have. And so I'm reminded a little bit of a language, let me digress just a minute here, an Assyrian man uh, at a college in uh, Illinois uh, who was a, um, a specialist in, in language and uh, evolution of language. And I was complaining to him how young people are screwing up English because they take these shortcuts. Oh, wait, 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 he says. You can't, you can't complain about that. He said, we don't speak the same English today that we did 100 years ago. You never, ever can complain about evolution. You can't complain about change because change is going to come, change is going to happen. And it's happening exactly the same with the Syrians. So, if you want to talk about the Assyrian food from the villages, you have to talk to uh, <clears throat> somebody as old as I am, who, whose mother really was able to uh, share these things. She never had a recipe. I, I mean, he, she made cakes for us for her birthdays. And I'll never forget, as I was going off to college one day, I asked her to scoop up a handful of flour for me and she dumped it on a piece of wax paper which I transferred into a measuring cup 
so that I could see what she meant when she said, well, you use four handfuls of flour and two eggs. And <laughs> so I was able to translate it into measures that, that meant something to me. So trying to preserve that is, is tough. It's going to depend on families keeping the tradition alive. Or write a cookbook. I some years ago thought I was going to do that. I, I started out and I was hoping that I would have a recipe for dolma from five or six different Assyrian villages. Certainly the people in the mountain villages use different ingredients than the people down in the plains area. And I thought it would be kind of neat to say here's a dolma from Ada and here's one from Marbishu and here's one from Goytapa and here's one from uh, Salamis. But uh, it, that it's going to take you have to find a lot of 90 year old people that are still around who can describe what they remember from the old days. So it's not an easy question to answer. I'm sorry. Oh, no, we'll, we'll talk later. Okay. We'll All right. So yes. Building off that question, I want to ask about the future development of the original cuisines. Uh, essentially, how might it be elevated using potentially either like French technique or re looking at traditional ways of cooking? You're, you're talking about regional cuisine right here. No, Persian in general. Oh, into Persian food. Yeah, ele- regarding like its elevation. I'm sorry, regarding? Elevation, as in the sense of what the French did. Yeah, elevating it. Um, Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, the, the question is the evolution of cuisine and how it's being elevated. What, what did I think of the fact that people are elevating it the way they are? I think maybe the best way to start answering that is to talk about Thomas Keller, who just opened the Mexican restaurant in Yountville. Um, when I was in Oaxaca visiting one time, I fell in love with this plant called Oja Sante, means the sacred herb or the sacred leaf. And it produces leaves that are like the size of a great big uh, spade of a shovel. Um, and it has a pungent character, maybe a little fennel related. And what most fascinated me was that tortillas were made by rolling the masa in the ojasanta leaf, which is edible and it also flavors it, as opposed to using corn husk, which is, you may as well use a piece of parchment for all you get out of the corn husk. It's a convenient material. Um, And looking at what he was doing, I thought, gee, that'd be a good place for me to take these hoja santa leaves. It produces so much stuff that we're throwing it into a compost heap. And I got halfway down the review, and it talked about one of his fish dishes that's wrapped in hoja santa leaves. So I'm presuming he's flying that in from Mexico, from Oaxaca. Um, if, if you really want to find a cuisine to elevate, I think he's on the track with the Mexican cuisine. We've been going to Mexico. In the early days, we used to go to Mexico at least once a year. But then we got frightened off by the killings and the the craziness around the drug dealing. And so we've gotten out of the habit. But I felt that Mexican cuisine was just a marvelous, marvelous cuisine. Unfortunately, in the United States, what we get is Mextex. You know, it's tamales and tacos and enchiladas and and the, the subtleties... You go into a spice market in Mexico, it's like being in a spice market in, in uh, Morocco. There's amazing confluence of, of herbs and spices that, that you can work with. So if elevating cuisine means taking the native ingredients and doing something more interesting with them, I, I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, but change just for the sake of change, I, I don't much care for. I'd like, to, I'd like to see a reason for your wanting to do this with that particular ingredient. Anybody else? Yes? Would you mention briefly how you got into the broadcast? (laughs) Uh, Sure, thank you. Uh, How I got into broadcasting, um, I had a friend who was a uh, a public relations person uh, when I opened the restaurant. As a matter of fact, she was a friend of Rachel Harris, the woman who invented the name Chocolate Decadence. Claire Harrison uh, in San Francisco and uh, she very quickly convinced me that buying advertising for a restaurant did not make any sense. That if I could do some media work that the exposure through media would be a lot more meaningful and a lot more useful. And uh, she introduced me first to 
the woman who was producing the um, um, the show with um, Kathy Crosby on Channel 5, a morning uh, television half-hour show. No, it was an hour show. And I did a cooking demonstration uh, one day. And um, we hit it off pretty well, so she was having me come back fairly frequently, like every couple weeks. Um, and, gee, we were planning one of those special dinners at the restaurant, so I did a recipe from the upcoming special dinner. The phone in the office started ringing before I got off the air with people making reservations. Uh, whoa, <laughs> you can't, can't beat this kind of return on investment. Uh, and so in 1984, a guy named Harvey Steinman, who was a, uh, a restaurant reviewer for the San Francisco Examiner, started a show called uh, the KCBS Kitchen that he did uh, Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning. And whenever he was out of town, he asked me to sit in for him. I sat in for him. I didn't get paid for it. I was just happy to do it. It, it, it was kind of fun. And so... Um, I was free on Saturdays uh, after I closed the restaurant. Uh, no, that was that was even before I closed the restaurant. I started doing a Saturday version of my own, which was the KCBS Saturday Kitchen from 10 to 12. And one of the, the gimmicks I came up with on that was that I tasted wine on the air, and I would announce a week in advance what two wines we were going to taste, usually a red and a white from the same winery. And believe it or not, people would buy the wine. It was always moderately priced wine. They'd buy it and taste it at home while I was on the air <laughs> tasting it, and then they'd call in and we'd talk about it. So then when the restaurant closed in 85, then I approached KCBS about starting the evening program. And that was from uh, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, Monday through Friday. We dubbed it Narcy and Company. And that lasted only until 1990. The... Uh, the big wigs from New York came out uh, from CBS and determined that KGO, which was the ABC station in town, was primarily talk with a lot of news. And KCBS was primarily news with a lot of talk. They said, we need to differentiate ourselves. So overnight, just click like that, it became an all-news station that ended the talk shows. And um, by then, of course, I was I was committed to it and enjoy it. and. Have continued. I've, I did one brief series on PBS. Um, was started by Hugh Downs and Mary Martin, uh, called Over Easy, and they dealt with the problems of aging in America. Um, and I did a cooking segment that you could easily prepare for one or two people. As we get older, we tend to be cooking for one or two people, and that was going really well. And then this man named Reagan came along that America got a favor by California getting rid of him and making him the president. So one of the first things he did was gut the budget for uh, PBS, and that was the end of, of, the, of that program. Um, I did a, a series for a Disney film that we uh, filmed at, not Disney film, Disney World. We filmed it at Disney World in Orlando. Um, and there was one more on PBS um, that dealt with food festivals around the country. We picked the winning recipe from these food festivals, and I showed the, the recipe on the air. So, you know, one thing leads to another when you you start doing something, and they like what you're doing and invite you back. And so, so there was that just, it sort of happened. Um, yes? Uh, what do you think of this, uh, the book... Um it's very popular now, and they had a Netflix show, Acid, Heat, Oh, uh, Fat. A question about Semin Nosrat's latest yeah. book. Uh, let's see, Salt, Acid, Heat, and what is it, the fourth oh, thing? Fat. 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 How can I miss the fat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Semin has done a wonderful job. She worked as a cook at Chez Panisse for a while, and then when Chris Lee, who she was working under, Chris had been my catering manager for... <coughs> Oh, 10 or 12 years. And when I closed, he went to work as a cook at Chez Panisse and became the chef after a few years. And uh, the two of them went off and opened a restaurant on 4th Street um, that sadly did not last very long. Um, 
but but she had a good background in working in the kitchen and she she takes these four basic elements and and shows you realistically how to deal with them in the kitchen i mean you don't even have to have the recipe if you you see what what you're dealing with so i think she's provided a very valuable thing that's a very useful book yes what is uh, what's the oldest tool or gadget you have or you or probably stays with you uh, do, you, do you have a favorite knife that and how many times you cut yourself? <laughs> oh, I cut myself more than enough times. Uh, what is the oldest gadget I have in the kitchen, and what's my favorite knife? My favorite knife for the longest time was a six inch uh, Wusthof, W U E S T H O F, uh, French knife. It was small enough to use it like a French A French knife is one that has a deep heel between the handle so that if you're chopping you can rock it like this um, and then I was at a conference um, where an Australian guy showed us a new knife that he had just created um, and will I come up with the name of it um, I'll think of it in a minute it was cast in a single piece of stainless steel uh, but the handle was hollow so it was not terribly heavy it was a little bit larger, it was seven inches long, and the handle was very smooth, but it was create was shaped to fit your hand wrapping around it. And I kept saying to him, but why didn't you put any grooves in there? Wouldn't that slip when your hand's wet or something? I think he got so frustrated with my questions, he said, just a minute, just a minute. He reached under the counter, pulled one out, brand new one in a box, and said, here, take this as my gift and see what you think of it it just immediately became my favorite knife. I use that, well, definitely more than any other knife for just about everything. As for the oldest gadget in the kitchen, wow, what would that be? I'm, I'm not too big on gadgets. I do have a, um, a grain mill that fits on my KitchenAid uh, five-quart mixer, and I grind things like black rice to make my my black rice bread and other unusual stuff like that. I grind my own malt to have a malt powder for my breads. I don't I can't think of any really old gadget in the way of Yes ma'am. Two questions. What's your favorite restaurant to eat at in San Francisco? Oh boy, that's an impossible one. And secondly, are are you familiar that the San Francisco Chronicle has changed its food critic format to a, a young millennial? Well you don't ask easy questions, do you? <laughs> My favorite restaurant in San Francisco, uh, I there really truly is not a favorite restaurant, but I can give you several that we really, really enjoy. Sure. Uh, just two nights ago we went to Jardinier, which sadly is closing. The 27th will be their last day. And interestingly enough, Tracy Desjardins' father is from Turlock. And when she first got to the Bay Area, she lived less than a half block away from us. And we went to Jardinier with a dear friend who was celebrating her uh, birthday. And we had been at her birthday uh, for her 70th birthday some years ago. And, uh, and she really wanted to go. And I managed to get through to Tracy even though there were no longer any reservations left. And it turns out that the house she lived in, in Berkeley for her first few months, was directly across the street from where our friend lived in Berkeley at that time. Uh, so we've loved Jardiner, uh, Piperade, uh, which is a French Basque restaurant we particularly enjoy, Farallon we particularly enjoy. Um, and Vini has, my wife, this wonderful phrase, Remember that um, that television show at the bar where everybody knows your name? Yeah, cheers. Yes. Uh, cheers. cheers. Well, it's it's there's a lot to be said for going to a place that you're comfortable with. I remember <coughs> maybe 30 years ago, American Express did a um, uh, a review of restaurant reviewers around the country, and when asked, would you prefer to go to a restaurant where you knew the food was really great? Or a, food, or a place where you didn't know for sure about the food quality, but you knew the kind of service they provided. And the great majority went for the place with the service. And you could easily see why. I, partly going back to a restaurant that somebody over here, a question somebody over here asked, 
about new restaurants, I firmly believe that today's young restaurateurs do not understand the meaning of the word restaurateur. It's a simple French word, restorer. You go to a restaurant to be restored. Food and beverage, of course, you've got to have food and beverage, but you want to be made whole again. You want to be made comfortable. You want to be taken care of. Uh, the single primary reason that I closed Narcy's was that I was involved with so many other things that I could no longer be in the restaurant. I had a cousin who was my assistant, my maitre d', my helper. People thought he was my brother. And for the first few years, we used to correct people until one day somebody came in and said, Jim, I'm sorry we missed you the last time we were here, but your brother really took good care of us. From that moment on, Sam was my brother. Well, he got tired and moved to Marbella in Spain. And all of a sudden, I saw that the only way we could have one of the Narsi brothers there, because everybody presumed our names were backwards anyway, um, was for me to be back on the floor six nights a week, and I was not willing to do that at that point in my life. So do I miss the restaurant? I do miss it, but not enough to make up for the pain and agony that goes with it. Um, did I answer both your questions? Yes, no. The second part was the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh, the Chronicle Reviewer. Soleil Ho. Yeah. I, I guess the um, the verdict is still out. The Chronicle got a new restaurant reviewer, Soleil Ho. Uh, I heard um, Ruthie Reichel being interviewed by Michael Krasny on KQED the other day. And she was waxing poetic about how exciting Soleil is and how she's bringing these new thoughts to the fore. And when I saw the article she did the other day about Swans, Oyster Depot, I, I just... I ended up just shaking my head and walking away thinking, what in the world has happened here? Uh, please don't ask about the Chronicle's new uh, theater reviewer, because I really would get, get off <laughs> on a tangent on that one. Leave it at the millennium. Right. Or about the Shape of Niche review, either. We won't ask you. That's about. right, right. The same kind of thing. <laughs> Who, other than yourself, do you most admire in the world? <laughs> well, um, I really like what um, uh, what happens at, at Piperod and at Farallon, um, Jardinier, um, uh, La Folie, Aqu Aquarello. But opening it up to the Ruth Reichels or the Tony Bourdans or the... Well then wait, would you rephrase the question then? Who in the food world at large, not just restaurants, but the food world. And it could be in any country, it could be... Oh, well then, that would probably be Tony Bourdain. I think um, he took restaurant reviews and, and restaurant exposure and new ideas <clears throat> to an absolute new height. There was every once in a while he'd get a little bit carried away with himself, but, but I thought he was brilliant in the way... I've noticed Martin Yan, who I know quite well for years, recently seems to be trying to emulate Tony. And it doesn't work because Martin's persona and his personality are wonderful when it comes to showing you how to do neat things with a knife, using a, a, a Chinese knife and doing Chinese dishes. But when he tries to incorporate new things and different things to incorporate travel and and such, it gets confusing. Tony was able to do it. So that was, that was very, very impressive to me. I think we're all out of time. Thank you so I much. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.